Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We welcome our Facebook congregation as well as we begin our Lenten journey. Uh, our sermon tonight is really the kickoff sermon for our uh, sermon series during Lent. Uh, the, the being challenge. I got to be careful. Some people have heard me say that and they think, the bean challenge, what are you going to do? Bake beans one week, navy beans the next week? Well, no, no, the bean challenge. So this sermon kicks off our, our bean challenge, but the rest of the sermons will be on Sundays uh, for that week. And so everything else is going to be tapped in, the, the PM pauses, the my uh, Wednesday uh, evening meditations uh, for the rest of Lent, uh, and then our Zoom classes uh, will also tap in all in all of that. So really a lot of focus on uh, the spiritual disciplines that Jesus used in his ministry, in his life. Uh, and also you will hear me uh, toward the end of the sermon talk about that as, as we see it in our text in Joel this evening. Uh, just again, want to remind you that uh, we will the, those in person who desire will receive the imposition of ashes during that part of the service. I guess those of you at home, if you've got a fireplace, you probably can do the same for yourselves. Uh, but also, uh, uh, when we get to that part of the service, as we do on Sundays, we will close with the benediction, and then we will move into the service of the sacrament for those of you in person. Uh, we will be following the order of worship as you see it uh, in, throughout the bulletin. Again, it's pretty, pretty typical to what we do on Sunday mornings with just a few changes. So as uh, God has gathered us in this place uh, for our time of worship, uh, as he has brought us here to receive the gifts that he gives to us through word and sacrament, we take some time for the spirit to mold and shape us for that worship. As we take a moment of meditation and prayer, you may let the Spirit guide that. You may use a scripture passage. You may use one of the hymns uh, as you uh, use that for your prayer. And we do so as the candles are being lit and the prelude is being played. Indeed, on this Ash Wednesday, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has heard our penitential cry as we cry out, Lord, have mercy. And as he hears us because of the waters of our baptism, we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand for the singing of the hymn.
Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you full pardon and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated. The Old Testament reading for Ash Wednesday is from Joel chapter 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, Call a, psalm, a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord. And make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? The epistle lesson is from 2 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 5. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he said, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found in our ministry, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in affliction, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, and yet well known, as dying, 
And behold, we live as punished and not yet killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. As we begin this Lenten season, we may not be wearing sackcloth and ashes, but we are heeding our Lord's call to return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. We join in King David's prayer of confession in Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your loving mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, and do I truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than the sun. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from all from my sins. And blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And as hold me with the willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Glory, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Almighty and everlasting God, you spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden and said, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Your people of ancient times wore sackcloth and ashes as a sign of repentance. We remember our sinfulness through the ashes and remember the gracious gift of forgiveness through the cross of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. you are to dust you shall 
brothers and sisters in Christ, our God has called us to return to him so that we might be reconciled and receive the reward of his forgiveness. The almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will, will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The congregation may be seated. <laughs>
peace and mercy from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to read you just the first few verses of our meditation this evening in Joel chapter 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never, before, has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all the generations. Betty, thank you for the, your reading of that whole text. I, I don't know if you intended it this way, but the lament in your voice really carries the feeling of the text because this truly is a lament. And if you look at the book of Joel, it's only three chapters long. So it's not a very long book, uh, but is a, a very important few words that Joel speaks, especially as he starts out here. Because again, in Joel 1 and 2, he's referring to a locust plague that is about ready to wreak havoc. Now, I've not been in a locust plague. I don't know if any of you have been. Okay, Gene has been. Uh, I've seen them on like National Geographic, and there's been some some of them recently. And and this is really where Joel is trying to capture the ears of the people, because he has an urgency to his call. In fact, he even says, "Sound the trumpet," and 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 that sounding of the trumpet was to be on alert. To be on alert because the day of clouds and thick darkness is about to come. And it was the clouds of locusts and it was the thick darkness as they cover, they blot out the sun. But also in Joel's telling of this, that the day of clouds and thick darkness is a sign of the coming day. Of the Lord. And typically when we hear the day of the Lord in the Old Testament is that day at the end of times. Well, we know one thing about Scripture. It's timeless. This is a timeless text. But you're probably going, uh, Pastor, uh, I don't see any locust plague about ready to happen. But when you look at what we've gone through in the last year, the current situation of the crises that I have preached on, especially at the last half of, uh, of 2020, you almost begin to get this vision of a locust cloud. Because again, with the coronavirus, with the social unrest, with the political upheaval, you, you get this sense of a present severity of, a, of the plague that is on the horizon and moving in. But I want to tell you tonight, nay, nay. Because that present severity of the pla plague that is on the horizon is the one that has been on the horizon since the fall of man. Because the present severity of the plague is the, the, was the present severity of the plague back, back in Joel's day. It was the present severity of the plague back in Moses' day when he dealt with a different kind of plague. It was the present severity of the plague in Martin Luther's day. And it especially was the present severity of the plague in Jesus' day. Because it wasn't about coronavirus, it wasn't about social unrest, it wasn't about political upheaval, all those, all those factor in. It's sin. 
That is the plague. And when you watch the approach of the plague, you see the approach of an enemy that wants to ravage us, just like a plague of, of locusts. And maybe just like you were thinking last year, I hope you're not thinking the same way right now, but in the reality of it is, sometimes we wonder. Some, sometimes we have to wonder, are we going to survive the looming plague that is about to wreak havoc? Well, what we try to do to protect ourselves is we establish our line of defense. Right? We establish our line of defense with masks, with uh, vaccines, with safe distancing. We establish our line of defense uh, in regards to social unrest by uh, some people want to protest, some people want to avoid the protest. Some people establish their line of defense by getting on Facebook and ranting or trying to simmer down the ranting. But we, we all, in one way or another, we, we, we try to establish our line of defense. And the first thing that we try to do is we try to resist the recognition and the admission of our own guilt. Because when you hear all, all the talk that has been going on about those three things, it's always, it's always about somebody else. It's always about what somebody else is doing or what somebody else is not doing. And we heard that in volumes last week, if you watched any of the trial. And we are guilty of doing just the same. That we want to resist any recognition and admission of our own guilt. We want, to, we want to resist the recognition and admission of our own wrongdoing. We want, to, we, we want to resist the recognition and the admission of the hurt that we cause others. And sometimes we slip into that because we are church people. We, we, we become a little sanctimonious high and holy. And, and, and so we want to rely on our, our church customs. We want to rely on our church practices. We want to rely on our church ceremonies that somehow, be, with, with putting a little dirt on our forehead, that somehow that takes care of us. Yet trouble, that plague, still persists. And there are times that you have felt, being your pastor for so many years, and I know that I have felt because as we dealt with our son, there's sometimes that trouble overwhelms. And we begin to wrestle to locate God in our midst. Just as Jesus did when he was in the garden. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he did on the cross. And so we wrestle to locate God in our midst. But what we end up finding time and time again is the way in which the world works. It cranks up the uncertainty and the doubt. It begins to whisper and grow loudly the fear that you should be experiencing and feeling. And the world wants to do nothing but bring chaos all around us. And that which we gather in as a sanctuary, we hope would be a garden, a pleasant garden to sit by and relax, ends up becoming a wilderness. Jack and I talked about wildernesses today. But that garden becomes a wilderness. And it brings us to a point of which scripture would call a day of suffering, a 
day of judgment. And you are just awaiting what is about ready to happen and the resulting experience of the disaster that's ready to swoop down. And so you hear the cry that Betty read right at the end, the cry of the people that are all around, and the cry of the people that are around us, the unchurched looking in on it, what will, where is your God, where is your God? And sometimes in our doubt, in our sinfulness, in our uncertainty, in our fear, in, in our midst of the chaos, We even ask the question, where is our God? And just as Joel speaks with the voice of God to the people here, he speaks to us tonight. Because God has come, God does come. And God speaks through the words of Joel to us tonight on this Ash Wednesday. As God tells us, yet even now, return to me with all your heart. And rend your hearts and not your garments. God calls you and me to repentance every day every week, every month, every year. God calls you and me to continual repentance. To the, as you can see on the bulletin cover, to the rending of your hearts. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, as we just read. To rend our hearts so that you and I may return to the presence of the Most Holy God. And it's, and it's God's words that sink and seep into our hearts to begin that process of mending. It's God's word, words that seep and sink into our conscience so that we can be brought to the realization of the healing that he has given to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they are words, first of all, of law. The law that humbles us. It's a word from God that leads us to contrition and confession. But it's ultimately a word that turns you and me, that turns each sinner back to God. So that we can turn back to God and trust in this God. And trust in His presence. A presence that challenges and changes us. A presence that comforts and confirms us. A presence that rescues and restores his suffering community. So now sound the trumpet. But don't sound the trumpet of warning. It's not a trumpet of warning any longer. Sound the trumpet. It is a call to worship. As we get ready this Lenten season with that call to worship, to go into seeing a, a few of these spiritual disciplines, some specific spiritual disciplines that we're going to look and examine. He's calling us to do that. He's calling us into these spiritual disciplines because they are marks. They are marks of a Christian 
marks of a heartfelt humility and trust in the God who has given us all that we need, not only to support this body and life, but, but to support that faithful witness that he desires us to be. And so God draws us in. God shows who he is. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. As Jack and I shared this morning, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which often gets misquoted. God doesn't give you any more than you can. Most people say handle. No, the passage says, God doesn't give you any more than you can bear. Yes, indeed, we are still under the burden of sin. But as God calls us and draws us in, he calls us to be a community. He calls us to be a community to come together. And as we go through this Lenten journey together, looking at the spiritual discipline, he calls us to come to this community together so that he can reorient our minds and our hearts to live that life of faith and how best to do it. And as he reorients us to Christ and his will, the Father's will, he's going to renew our walk toward him, but even more importantly, our walk with him. And so as we just spoke from, from David's words, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a, with a willing spirit. So return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Amen. We continue our worship with our uh, profession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I invite the congregation to please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. O Lord, we thank you for calling us to return to you. We place our confidence and trust in the reality that you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and to relent over disaster. O Lord, through Christ, you reconciled us to yourself and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. We are your servants, believe and empower us by your scripture to live lives worthy of this calling that we have received. O Lord, you have freely rewarded us with the gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Believe Lead us to serve you in spirit as we would the world watching, so that others may see you through us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, 
by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. All and, us, good Lord. Lord. in all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment. All all us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, O Lord, to prosper the preaching of your word, to bless our prayer and meditation, to strengthen and preserve us in the true faith, and to give heart to our sorrow and strength to our repentance. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. To draw all to yourself, to bless those who are instructed in the faith, to watch over and console the poor, the sick, the distressed, the lonely, the forsaken, the abandoned, and all who stand in need of our prayers. Give abundant blessing to all works of mercy, and to have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, dear Lord. To turn our hearts to you, to turn the hearts of our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore you to hear us, dear Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. O oh God, you desire not the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. We implore you to have compassion on the frailty of our mortal nature, for we acknowledge that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Mercifully pardon our sins, that we may obtain the promises you have laid up for those who are, who are your own. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Grant you his peace.